All right. Well, welcome on, James. I'm so, so very excited to have you on here and so excited to talk about your amazing book, Breath, The New Science of a Lost Art. Um, so welcome and thank you for taking the time to be on here with me. Oh, thanks a lot for having me. Absolutely. Um, so first question I have is if you want to just share with the audience what made you read this book for those that might not have been able to read it yet. Well, uh, it was a number of things kept accumulating. I kept finding little pieces of research that were interesting to me, and I uh, wanted to explore them a little more deeply. Uh, I think a big jumping off point for me was meeting freedivers and learning what they were able to do with breathing and wondering what else breathing could do for us. Uh, they told me many things uh, that breathing not only could help you learning the art of breathing, could help you hold your breath for five, six, seven, eight nine minutes at a time, but it could also heat your body up and heal yourself of chronic problems. So it sounded like crazy stuff, but I was interested enough to really dig in. Absolutely. Um, now you knew for a while that you were a mouth breather or what, like, let's talk about that. Like childhood wise, mm -hmm. were you a mouth breather? Um, yeah, like where did it all start for you? It's it's hard for me to go back in time. I see some pictures and, and yeah, my mouth was open. But, you know, uh, I know that I've been mouth breathing at night for as long as I can possibly remember because mm -hmm. I always go to sleep or I used to go to sleep with a huge jug of water and mm -hmm. would wake up with my mouth dry every, you know, every few hours I'd wake up, have some more water. And I thought that this was completely normal. Mm -hmm. As far as, you know, in, in childhood, there there's some pictures you know, I was trying to think uh, when I was working out or, you know, running around, I'm sure I was mouth breathing quite mm -hmm. a bit. Um, but I don't know definitively how much, but, but I do know in adulthood, uh, when I was working out, uh, when I was sleeping, I was definitely breathing through my mouth for sure. Um, now, what breathing techniques did you find most beneficial? Uh, they're all different tools in the toolbox. You know, it depends on what you're looking for. If you want energy, if you want to relax, if you want focus. So that's what I like about breathing is you can really use these different breathing elements, different breathing practices to elicit different feelings, um, to make your body react in certain ways to different mindsets. Mm -hmm. And, and we know that's true. And it's, it's breathing's great because it's so easy to measure. You know, a lot of people say, oh, it sounds like placebo effect to me or it's psychosomatic. You can just measure it. You can measure what happens to your blood pressure, to, to your blood sats, mm -hmm. even what's happening in your mind, your brain waves. Yeah. I mean, these are easy measurements and, and it has a transformative effect, just a few minutes of breathing in a certain way. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, kudos to you. Thank you to you for doing, you know, the study that you did with Stanford and being kind of the guinea pig and clogging up your nose and doing that whole thing. I mean, we need, that's why it's so hard, you know, to get research on this. Like you were saying that the doctor said, it's, you know, kind of unethical to be doing this to patients, but when somebody wonderful like you volunteers, it's great for the field because I mean, the results that, you know, were shown. Um, so if you want to talk a little bit, like how you initially felt, you know, that first day when you were just completely, obviously clogged up. <laughs> yeah, it felt awful. And we knew it wasn't going to feel pleasant. Uh, right. Dr. Jayak or Nyack at Stanford is like, this is not going to feel good, but we're kind of laughing about it. We said, anyone can do anything for 10 days. It doesn't seem like that, right. that long of a stretch of time. And we thought it would be a, a very slow curve. Um, mm -hmm. If anything would happen, we thought it was going to be slow. It was instantaneous. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at blood pressure, if you look at our sleep quality, if you look at fatigue, if you look at anxiety, I mean, it would just everything plummeted right from the get go. So, um, and you know, it's one thing in the daytime because you can take conscious control of your breathing, but it's another thing at night um, to look at all the data that uh, related to sleep and, and sleep apnea. So you can't fake that. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it was just so sudden and so horrifying and just made me think of all those people who, you know, are, aren't told that the pathway through which they breathe can play a very significant effect on how much they're snoring and even sleep right. apnea. You know, half the population snores, a quarter suffers from sleep apnea. And nobody really knows this. And that, that was really shocking to me. Yeah, absolutely. And 
I feel like some people don't even know how poor their sleep actually is. I mean, they know they're tired, they know, you know, whatever, but they don't really understand like the ramifications of when you're not reaching like that stage three sleep. And, you know, for me, I'm a myofunctional therapist and I say I have a patient sent to me, you know, to work on like their tongue thrust. You know, the parents come in and they think that I'm going to do just that. I'm the tongue thrust lady and I'm going to work on tongue exercises and fix the swallow. And then I start asking them questions like, how are they sleeping? How are they breathing? Do you hear them breathe? Are they snoring? You know, do they get up? All this stuff. And they kind of look at me like, uh, well, first they don't really know because for kids, I mean, once your child can sleep through the night, it's not usual for you to, you know, check in on them. So a lot of parents are like, you know, I don't really know. I know that he stays in his room all night. Um, so I just feel like it's just such a topic that needs to be talked about more. And that is why I loved your book so much because you just, you break it down so easily. I just, everything about your book was literally perfect. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing that I think is, is important to note is, is I had no slant going into this. Why would I want to think that mouth breathing was bad and nasal breathing was right. good? Like my, my job was to, and I spent years doing this, talking to the experts in the field at the mm -hmm. top institutions and really trying to find the story behind all this. And, and it's so awesome is when it comes to breathing, when it comes to sleep, when it comes to neurological disorders attached to poor breathing during sleep. I mean, to me, there's not a lot of ambiguity between those things anymore. There's 20, okay. 30 years worth of science. Look at Dr. Christian Guillemot down at uh, Stanford. He's been mm -hmm. studying it for 50 years and the science is so clear, but no one was talking about it. You right. know, a lot of people that, that I know, their infants snoring, uh, they say, oh, it's so cute. He's over there snoring. And I always thought that as well. Mm -hmm. Then you realize how, what a horrifying effect this is having on their yeah. health, mental health. I mean, even, you know, so I'm also a dental hygienist. That's how I became a myofunctional therapist. And we were always told if a kid comes in and they clench and grind their teeth, like it's a phase, kids go through it. That's it. They will see you back in six months. Never, you know, did I ever learn to be asking all these questions about sleep. And, you know, I don't, I still don't really think it's taught in the dental hygiene curriculum, how important, you know, sleep medicine is, um, and just sleep in general. Um, it wasn't until I became a myofunctional therapist that I was able to connect all these, do these dots. And then I was like, wow, the light bulb went off. Like this makes such total sense. Like, how is this not being talked about? Yeah, and you look at sleep medicine too, and, and so much of sleep is focused on anxiety and insomnia, but half of, I mean, there was one report in the Mayo Clinic several years ago that looked at half the people who had insomnia had sleep apnea. Half the people who had sleep apnea had insomnia. So it doesn't take a lot of imagination to put these two pieces together and say, right. don't you think there's a correlation between these? And, and the fact that people who have chronic insomnia are treated with tranquilizers, which mm -hmm. actually makes their snoring and sleep apnea worse many, in, uh, oftentimes. I mean, it was, it was astounding to me. I've never written this deeply about the human body. I've never written about medicine like this. And you talk to these experts, you look at the science, and it was just astounding that, that other people weren't putting the pieces of this puzzle together. Right. Absolutely. A hundred percent. And you got to meet some really awesome people, you know, along your journey. And I told you, I had kind of put out there some questions for other people that they wanted to ask you um, who have read your book. And there were a couple people that wanted to know, you know, more about the time that you spent with Dr. Kevin Boyd and uh, Dr. Mariana Evans. So if you want to talk about them a little bit and your time with them, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Sure. So you know, I had always learned that crooked teeth were inherited. Uh, and to, I guess, to some extent that that's starting to happen. This is what Kevin Boyd is finding, even though he can see in a fetus, some, some retronathic growth in, in fetuses. But um, then, the, you know, they asked me, a, a few other biological anthropologists asked me, they said, well, why do humans have crooked teeth? I was like, oh, they're inherited. That doesn't really make too much sense. If our ancestors had perfect teeth, something must have happened to, to create that epigenetic change in our faces to cause crooked teeth. 
So this just blew me away. And I had no idea that I was going to be going down this, this rabbit hole is really what it is into looking at the true causes of crooked teeth. And so I was lucky enough to meet Mariana Evans and flew out to Philadelphia and toured the Morton collection, which is one of the largest collections of pre-industrial skulls. And it's pretty creepy and also pretty sad to see all of these skulls from, you know, thousands of years old to just a few hundred years old, all looking back at you with perfectly straight teeth. And then you go out into the street, you hop on the, on the train to go to the airport. Everyone's messed up like me. I had, I had bad teeth, you know, extractions, headgear, all that stuff. So to me, that's such a simple thing. And it's so obvious that something's happened in our society to cause crooked teeth. And if you have a smaller mouth, it's going to be harder to breathe. And we, that's, that's so clear as well. So the fact that some of this is still controversial is, is absolutely beside me. Right before I uh, got on this call, I just read the New York Times Magazine article about the muse. Mm -hmm. And the, the journalist seems to be suggesting that this is still a fringe theory, that crooked teeth are caused by soft foods. It's been for the past few decades, people have been studying this. And so you see that in the New York Times, I'm like, this guy did not even do his homework to, to right. look at the true causes mm -hmm. of crooked teeth. But this has been, this I guess shouldn't be shocking, even though it is being in this world, looking at the data, talking to the researchers, seeing the skulls right in front of you right. and still have people go, oh, that's, that's weird. They had straight teeth and we have crooked teeth anyway, onto something else. <laughs> totally bizarre to me. Oh my gosh, I can't even, I can't even begin to imagine. Um, but you brought up my next thing I wanted to talk about. Um, if you want to touch on the importance of chewing and why chewing is so important. Mm -hmm. Well, I think chewing really starts in infancy. And this is something that Kevin Boyd has done a lot of work in looking at the stress required for breastfeeding and how that will help pull a child's face out and that masticatory stress is going to help model bones. And to me, that's also, if you're breastfeeding for two hours every day for two years and your face is going to be pulled out, I mean, just guess what's going to happen. Right. And I think some, some of the studies looking at kids who have been breastfed versus those who have been bottle fed and looking at incidences of snoring and sleep apnea later in life, make it very clear that that's going to affect the structure of your face. Right. So it's not just those those two years, which are really important. It's mm -hmm. after that as well. So even if a kid has been bottle fed, if you're just eating soft processed foods, like I did back in the day, that's just what I thought was was available. White bread, Velveeta, mm -hmm. peanut butter. I mean, what up, bananas, mm -hmm. you know, Reggie bars. So, yeah. so you know, what what can you do? Um, so I think that those, it's, it's so, again, this is something that at, Look at Robert Corcini's work. It's so clear that chewing stress is required to have, not for everybody. Some people naturally have a very powerful jaw, um, mm -hmm. but, but it will greatly influence how your teeth are going to grow in. It will greatly influence your upper palate, allow it to actually drop back down instead of being V-shaped like mine is. And, and again, this is these are things that have been thoroughly documented and measured for, for decades. So I, again, I don't view this as a fringe theory. I view it as a scientific fact, you know? Yeah. And you know, there's still some people that say, um, airway dentistry is a fad. And when they say that to me, I'm like, how can airway ever be a fad? I mean, literally, if you don't breathe, there's only one other option, you know, you're dead. So <laughs> Yeah, and, and that, you know, a lot of people are protecting their turf. Uh, orthodontists right. have been done in the same way for 50 years. You don't want to tell someone who's been doing something for 40 years that they've been doing it wrong, even though science is not a closed book. It doesn't just stop. Like, mm -hmm. we have to continually learn and improve upon science. We, we can't right. just take, I mean, look, just look at food, what's happened with food. Mm -hmm. Like, we were told that, you know, this high-carb, high-sugar stuff was great. Bowl of Captain Crunch in the morning some, you know, peanut butter and jelly sandwich in the afternoons, <laughs> you know, canned beans at, at night, that, that that was optimum health. And, and we know you'd be hard pressed to find someone 
who wouldn't say that whole foods are better for us now, nutritionally, because of chewing stress, because of the environment, on and on. But that took decades for that message to get through. And it's still not really getting through to a large chunk of the population, even though the science is there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I always say there should be, you know, for everybody, every, you know, pregnant mom, there should be a class for the importance of all of this on the child, airway, craniofacial development, everything, because it's just, it's so missed. Um, you know, I, I had a couple friends, so, you know, we look a lot at like tongue tie, tethered oral tissues, lip tie, all that stuff. And it goes undiagnosed so, so often, especially if they're not having issues breastfeeding. But even for those moms that are having issues breastfeeding, you know, and the baby gets reflux or whatever, you know, there's some pediatricians out there and you can't expect them to know everything that will say, oh, you know, it's fine. We're just going to put them on reflux meds. And I, I'm at the age where like everybody I know is having a baby. And during our quarantine, like three of my either close friends or friends of friends or whatever had babies and they were all tied. And I could literally like tell from the pictures they posted on social media. And, um, you know, so I, I reached out to them to ask them how everything was going. And I kind of gave them my opinion and they were like, well, why nobody, you know, nobody ever told me that, you know, no, my doctor didn't say anything. And it's just, there's not enough education. And again, that's why, you know, your, your book is just going to bring so much attention to this. And it, we just, especially those of us in this field, like we just truly appreciate it. And that's why when you answered the, uh, the call and I told you, I was so excited to have you on because it's just going to make people be more aware. And I just think, you know, it's fantastic. So I know I thanked you, but I'm thanking you again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, um you know, I, I just have to, to say one, one thing about that is, you know, a lot of people aren't going to care about the science. They're going to continue soft foods. They're going to eat at Burger King every day. And, and that's all fine. I'm, I'm not one who's going to force, wants to force anyone to do anything. What mm -hmm. I think would be most appropriate, though, is to at least give these people a choice right. to say, hey, there is a firm foundation of science showing that tongue tie problems are going to have all these problems downstream and i was i was tongue tied mm -hmm. um so so and, and pushed out the bottom teeth mm -hmm. i mean uh, every everything yeah. so you know to give them a choice to to empower themselves to try a different approach to approach the core problems mm -hmm. uh instead of addressing the symptoms like the idea of someone has has GERD just being like here's a pill take that well why do you have GERD? What's happening in your body to, to give you that? Mm -hmm. um, it, it just, it's such common sense in my mind, but that's just not how the, the system has really been working. And hopefully that's changing now. Yeah, a hundred percent. I totally agree with you. Um, I definitely want to talk about your experience. Um, so you worked with Dr. Belfort um, with the homeo block. Um, so if you want to share on that experience, um, you know, I know I don't want to give away everything that I read in the book. So just you, you talk about it and, you know, I know you had some expansion um, and just let people know. Well, actually, if you want to talk about what the homeo block is, because I'm sure not all the listeners know exactly what it is. Sure. So I heard about this device of palatal expansion. I never heard that, that term before in my whole life. Mm -hmm. And then I got in touch with, with Ted Belfour and we went out to lunch. I was like, is this guy a scammer, a huckster, whatever? And then he showed me some scans of, of people having significant benefits to their airways by, by just slightly expanding their palates. And they were also growing new bone in their face. And I said, this is totally impossible and he had been met with resistance for for decades people were mocking him his colleagues were mocking him even though he had scans to show it they thought he photoshopped the scans so i thought well if i really want to understand this and god knows i i needed some help as well um why not try it and see what happens and take a scan before i i wore this thing so the homeo block is you only wear it at night it's removable it is an expander that goes the top of your mouth, has a little dowel screw that you turn about every week, and it just very, very slowly opens up to, to open up that suture in, in your top palate, okay? And, and anyone, almost anyone at any age can, can have expansion because that suture opens and you can stimulate 
stem cells with chewing on and on. So, you know, I took a, I wore it for a year. I was very serious about it. I wore it almost every single night, probably yeah. 350 nights out of the year because I wanted to see if it would actually do anything. That's I amazing. started feeling different. I, I was just like, I think I'm breathing easier, but I was like, oh, it must be psychosomatic. Mm -hmm. Until I saw the scans. And I mean, it was so obvious what, what had happened. I had, I had huge benefits mm -hmm. to my airway tone. It opened up maybe 15%. Um, the pus and granulation that was in my sinuses was completely gone, which was probably caused, Belfort thought, we don't know, mm -hmm. his hypothesis was, that I had upper airway resistance syndrome, okay. uh, which, which I probably did. Mm -hmm. So not only did I feel better is, is the data was very clear on what happened to me. And he has so many case studies. And, and we know this from, from, I think Gelb released a study about 10 years ago, Michael Gelb, um, where they fitted kids with, with uh, homeoblocks and bioblocks and found that they were able to increase their airways by like 30% in some areas after six months. Yeah. And obviously, if you have a larger airway, you're gonna have less obstruction. You're gonna be able to breathe easier. This is, it's, it's so simple. There's, there's no magic to it. Right. Larger airway, easier breath. Why wouldn't people want that? Especially with people who, who snored or had sleep apnea. For sure. Now, are you still wearing um, the whole meal block? I gave myself a little break, okay. so I, I took a little break from it, but, but I was talking to Ted a couple of months ago. He's like, how's it going? We should take another scan. And I was like, uh, well, give me a few months. So I'm back on it. I'm back on the homeo block. And uh, so we're just curious to see what's going to happen, if, this is, if I'm going to continually uh, improve mm -hmm. or if I've reached my maximum of improvement, which is has not been subtle at all. It, is, it has been pretty profound. And so we'll see in six months. I probably won't write about this. I'm just curious. I was like, can you continually improve or do you reach a plateau? I guess. guess right. we'll see. Yeah, to be determined. Um, okay, so one of the questions um, somebody had was, so you have a deviated septum. Um, why did you choose not to have it corrected surgically? Yeah, when they took a CAT scan at Stanford, Dr. Jack or Nyack was kind of laughing at my sinuses, which is not a good, you don't really want your doctor to be doing this when he's looking at a scan of you. So he said, you're, you know, you're a candidate for nasal surgery. But I had heard so many stories about, uh, so to be clear, nasal, nasal surgery, sinus surgery is life-changing for so many people. Mm -hmm. When it's done right, it will absolutely transform someone's health, their happiness, their mm -hmm. physical activity, like on and on and on. So I'm a big fan of it, but it has to be done right. Mm -hmm. And I had heard some stories about people who had had too much of their sinuses drilled out. So there wasn't enough resistance. We need that pressure to, to right. extract oxygen most efficiently. I talked to these people. It's a huge population of people. Mm -hmm. It represents probably less than 1% of the people who've gotten uh, nasal surgery. But, but still, that wasn't necessarily why I didn't do it. It was mm -hmm. mostly because I went down the hall from NIAC and met Ann Kearney, who's mm -hmm. a doctor of speech language pathology at Stanford. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to her about it. And she said, I was a mouth breather for, for decades. I, I thought that this was normal. And she was slated for surgery. It was so bad. But knowing what she knew about the nose, which was a lot, knowing what she knew about the body's ability to heal itself, she mm -hmm. thought, oh, I'm going to try to just breathe through my nose. I'm going to use a little bit of tape and see what will happen. After a few months, her nose completely opened up. So wow. inspired by her, instead of rushing into surgery, I said, well, at least I'm going to try this first, which is always a good thing. Try the mellow thing. Use a neti pot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you have allergies, maybe a little Claritin uh, can help. Use your nose as much as possible. Use a little bit of tape at night. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. And I have had no problems. And this is, this is clear from the scans, too, that I've, I've shown mass improvement. So wow. I, I just want to be clear, this is not to steer anyone away from fixing right, the absolutely. septum at all, but each person's different. And what I would suggest, and I'm only suggesting this after talking to the real pros in this field, is 
start slow. It's not, if you've had a deviated septum your whole life, it's not going to hurt you to try for a healthy nasal breathing for a month or to right. use a neti pop for a month. And that's exactly what NIOC does. He, something like 23 out of 28 people who used a low dose steroid mm -hmm. in a neti pot didn't really feel need for surgery after that or balloon sinusplasty, which isn't surgery. It's a little balloon that goes up there and opens right. it up. So I, my personal opinion, if I still needed some work done and I do aesthetically, I'm, I'm not going to do anything about it, about it now because I broke my nose like four times. <laughs> if I did need, need to breathe better through my nose, I would try those mellower um, therapies first yeah. because there's not, there's no harm in doing that. For sure. hundred percent. And, you know, nasal hygiene is also something I feel like that isn't practice enough or even really talked about even just a preventative measure. Um, you know, we talk about this a lot as myofunctional therapists, you know, we brush our teeth, we take showers, but nobody really thinks to take care of our precious nose, which we know to be very, very important. Um, so you had brought up lip taping a little bit, which made me think about reactions from my patients. And I talk about lip tape and they say to me, well, how am I supposed to have a sip of water if my lip, if my lips are taped? And I'm like, well, you're not supposed to need that sip of water. So interestingly, I didn't know about vasopressin, which I learned about in your book. Um, so if you want to talk about, you know, vasopressin and kind of that correlation between how you really shouldn't need um, that drink of water in the middle of the night. Sure. So I learned this from Dr. Mark Rahani and Dr. Stephen Park, two real experts in this field who were kind enough to conduct a few interviews with me. Or Stephen Park's written a few books about this. Um, and as a journalist, that's my job is to go out and talk to these people and accumulate this research. And I was fascinated by this as well. So when you aren't entering these deep stages of sleep, your body doesn't release this antidiuretic hormone. And if it doesn't release this, you are gonna feel the need to pee more often. Because the way that an animal can sleep, I watch my dog sleep in you know, 14 hours a day. The way that she can do that is because of this release of this hormone. Mm -hmm. And so when people have sleep apnea, or even to a certain extent when they're snoring and constantly are being woken up and not able to go into those deep stages of sleep, and Matthew Walker talks about this as well in his awesome book, Why We Sleep, then it disrupts the body's functions, it disrupts how that hormone gets distributed and it disrupts your ability to hold water properly. Right. And this was something that we noticed in the Stanford experiment when we were mouth breathing, our noses were plugged, is I was waking up to pee like three or four times a night, which mm -hmm. was bizarre. Even when I, and I said, okay, no water two hours before bed, mm -hmm. it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was very strange to, to actually feel that in your own body. So, you know, like your patients, I used to sleep uh, with a big glass of water mm -hmm. ever since I started closing my mouth at night. I have zero need to do that. I mean, I'm talking for decades. I slept with a big glass of water mm -hmm. and I couldn't, it didn't matter, hotel, camping, whatever. I always had to have water by. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the thing that turns people off to sleep tape, and of course I have some right here, <laughs> is, is that people think that this is, you know, some hostage situation, people with anxiety, they're like, how do you do this with a, with a beard? It's impossible. You need surgery. What I think has not been communicated very clearly is this is how I sleep tape. I know a lot of people use it in different ways. That's all great. There's Somnifix. There's all these other products. I take a piece about that big and mm -hmm. put it right here. Mm -hmm. So I can talk to you. Right. I can breathe out of the side. I can cough. <clears throat> mm -hmm. If I suddenly want to open my mouth, I use my tongue and it comes off. So when people say, I can't believe you're you know, prescribing this to kids are gonna choke and die, it's complete fiction. And if you look at Patrick McEwen's myotape, mm -hmm. which I think is fantastic, it's like, okay, in my mind. <laughs> we're not gonna put anything on your mouth. Yeah. Even though he's used sleep tape for 20 years, right. he said, I've never had anyone have a problem with this, mm -hmm. nonetheless, this goes around the mouth and just gently, and that in many ways is what this little piece of sleep tape does for me. Right. You're not trying to hermetically seal your lips shut. You're just trying to train yeah. your You definitely jaw. don't want to put a piece of duct tape over the lips, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, I've seen all this, people have been riding, dozens of people riding me, masking tape, and 
duct tape and it's it's just all the uh, cnn luckily released i thought that they were right interviewing me to like slander this idea but they released a great great story today about mouth taping and the the real science and the oh, benefits of nasal breathing at night and they interviewed the right people they interviewed stephen park who knows more yeah. about this stuff than anybody absolutely and you know i recommend lip taping a lot i mean obviously it depends on their everybody's different you can't recommend to every single person but the majority of my patients as long as it's okay with their other health issues if they have any going on um because we talk so much about modifying behaviors you know and during the day yeah we can be conscious of what our oral posture is we can be conscious and have check-ins of how we're breathing how our lips are but when you're sleeping i mean it kind of goes out the door and you're sleeping for however long, six, eight, 10, 12 hours, however old you are, however long you're sleeping. And it just, it's, we're not going to progress as much as we want if we're not, you know, getting these habits that we're doing during the day to go into nighttime. So that's why I, I'm definitely a fan of the lip tape. I do get a lot of like heads that turn at me. Like, is she real? Is that? And I go, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, like I'm saying, we're going to tape the lips. <laughs> That's simple. <laughs> I think though that the more that people actually hear of the benefits of nasal breathing and how damaging mouth breathing is, why would anyone want to continue doing that? And I understand if people are nervous about it or apprehensive, which is why I think the stuff needs to be communicated in the right way. And right. people go on YouTube, you know, there's some guy who has like 12 pieces of tape and a goatee, <laughs> some 10 minutes every night. I was like, what? <laughs> This is what people are, are looking at, you know, as their reference for the benefits. Right. Of <laughs> and, and I hope they, they, you know, look at some other options. It doesn't have to be more is more. Less is more, in my opinion, when it comes to sleep. Yeah, breathing. we just want, it's serving a reminder, you know, for your brain. Okay, oh, hey, there's something on my lips. I'm going to keep them shut. Um, and then obviously it helps bring those lips um, together a little bit more. I've been trying to read this question and, and condense it a little bit, but I'm just going to read it off the paper from how the, the person asked. Um, can you say more about the complete exhale or full exhale? We even have the, the page quoted, page 209. You talked about getting the air out of us before taking a new one in. Do you mean something more than a longer exhalation? Would there be any effort involved other than allowing the air to be released fully before the next inhalation? Wow. Okay. We'll so I guess maybe that. let's talk about the complete <laughs> exhale. <laughs> so start, start with the beginning one. Um, so the only way to get in a big nourishing breath of air is to get out that old air first. And a lot of us just tend to pack in air, especially when we're working out. Mm -hmm. What we want is we want the diaphragm to be able to rise up as we exhale. And there's so many other benefits, biomechanical benefits to having that diaphragmatic movement right. from lymph fluid to blood flow. I mean, it goes on and on and on, but just talking about air and airflow, you don't wanna keep putting air on top of air. You mm -hmm. want to exhale fully. And if you exhale fully and that next breath will be so much more enriching, that means you can breathe less, but get more oxygen. That means you can exert less effort to work more efficiently. And that's what the body wants. Yeah. So right now, if I'm going to breathe 20 times a minute, just breathe through my mouth, my heart rate is going to go up. My blood pressure is very likely going to go up. Mm -hmm. If I switch that and breathe at half that rate, even less than that, my blood pressure is likely going to go down. My heart rate's going to go down. My body is going to be able to operate in the state of coherence. Right. And that's what you want. I mean, 24 hours of the day, the, the body can compensate. It really can. It's so good at that. It's going to keep you alive. That doesn't mean it's going to keep you healthy. So right. I really think that the anchor to so many of our systems in our body is our breathing. Mm -hmm. We can influence so many systems with this. So part of that is by really exhaling and don't approach this like a crazy westerner and just say i'm gonna exhale so much every single breath i'm gonna get the biggest breath because that's <laughs> how we do things chill out do yeah. it extremely softly especially at the beginning if you've been sitting on a couch for two years you're not going to go out and run a marathon you're right. going to get you're going to mess up your body mm -hmm. you can also throw this 
this whole structure, your lungs, the musculature in your chest, the ribs, out of shape if you just <sighs> said, I can do that because I've been doing this stuff for a while. But someone to just suddenly do that, right. uh, it, it's bad news. You got oh. so so start softly. And there's there's no harm in starting softly and slowly acclimate yourself to having that more full exhale. One exercise that uh, Carl Stau revolutionized that he used with not only Olympians, but emphysemics mm -hmm. is vocalize when you're exhaling. And so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, nine, ten, one, two, three, four, five, six. And you keep one through 10. Mm -hmm. And even if, at the end of your breath, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, you keep whispering because that vocalization is gonna allow you to get more of a workout there from that mm -hmm. diaphragm uh, rather than just doing it without a vocalization. Right. So, but again, do the, do this softly, and and that is why and a large exhale. It's like putting, you know, if your your tank is half full in your car, you can fill it up. That's cool, but you know, it's it's better. You will get a longer mileage if you wait till it is almost empty and then fill it up, and you'll Absolutely. be able to go further. So, um, and then in the book, you talked about how they used breathe the, uh, was it resonant breathing for the 9-11 uh, survivors? Yeah, yeah. Um, so coherent breathing, so resonant breathing, I mean, whatever you want to call it, but it's about five to six breaths a minute, which works out to about an inhale of five to six, exhale to five to six. I called it 5.5, but then I got some emails from people really worried that they were off by a half second and they were wondering what was happening to their health. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, no created some monsters here so anything in the rain and the point is to be relaxed so right you know maybe four to seven four to eight yeah. um press a minute is is good uh but they they found like that the ultimately most efficient breath is in that five to six seconds in five to six seconds out and you can see this again breathing so great because it's so easy to measure you look at autonomic nervous system function mm -hmm. through hrv you look at blood flow you look at oxygenation of the brain and they've done all these studies and found that just breathing this way can place the body in that state of resonance or coherence or efficiency or whatever you want to call it um now i don't have there were some questions asked by I put them up on my phone quick um some crossfit people and they wanted to know um, if they should be exclusively nasal breathing during these, you know, particular CrossFit workouts. I'm not sure if you're familiar with all of that, um, but if you want to touch some on that. I've done I know a lot you're of reading that. this person right now. He, I think your book's on cue. He's finishing um, Patrick McCune's The Oxygen Advantage, and he's like super, like ready to learn about all this. Yeah. So for 10 years, I boxed and did very intense martial arts and grappling and all of that. And this is some of the most, uh, to me, it was certainly the most physically demanding exercise that I could mm -hmm. ever do, especially boxing. And I would still be doing it if such, such gyms and places were open right now. So I always thought there's no way I'm going to be able to get enough air in, especially during these, these states. And so <sighs> you open your mouth and you just start breathing like that. But mm -hmm. we've shown through so many decades of research that once you acclimate to nasal breathing, I'm not saying you can immediately switch and you're going to have the same level of performance and recovery. You aren't. So it takes a while to acclimate to this, which is why so many people give up on it. Even after a few days, I said, screw this. There's no way it's working for me. I can't. Sometimes Dr. John Duyar found that this, this could take weeks or months. Yeah. But the advantages of this are so clear and so pronounced. And that's been one of the most wonderful things is hearing from runners, ultra marathoners, from boxers, from CrossFit people saying it really sucked the first couple of weeks of doing this. But once I got it, oh my God, my performance increased. My recovery was took about half the time. Because yeah. what you're doing is you're using oxygen most efficiently. If you are breathing into your chest and you're breathing, <laughs> you're filling up your mouth, you're filling up your throat, you're filling up the bronchi, but you're not filling up the lower lobes of the lungs. So there's right. no gas exchange in these areas. Mm -hmm. You are forcing yourself to just breathe 
taking air in and out without using it. So breathing through the nose is gonna slow down and pressurize that air. You get 20% more oxygen mm -hmm. compared to mouth breaths, the yep. same amount of breaths. So 20%, you think that's not gonna help you for endurance and performance, it will. But again, a lot of the pushback is, is people say, I've tried it, I can't do it. But if you look at Phil Maffetone, if, if you talk to CrossFitters who have done this, if you look at Dr. John Duyard's work, you know, decades of work on this stuff, it's so clear that the benefits, and, and this is not psychosomatic again, it is measurable right. benefits to this. Absolutely. Really um, now have, you, have you used a nasal dilator when you worked out? I just, uh, I have not. Uh, I just got some of those in the mail. Someone wanted me to try them out. And so I said, I'll, I'll try it. I don't have problems with that anymore. I think my right. threshold for CO2 has, has gone up, but yeah. I've also worked out like a maniac at a gym on a, on a stationary bike to just see how slower breathing would affect my O2, mm -hmm. my blood stats, because that's the real test, right? Okay. Everyone's different. Everyone has a different nose. Everyone's breathing slightly differently. But I tried to breathe. So usually when I'm really working out at a hard rate on a bike, I'm maybe 40 breaths per minute, three, five breaths per minute, which and you can even go higher than that. I try to breathe at six breaths per minute, which is you know a sixth of what I normally would. But taking these huge breaths in and huge breaths out and my and i said oh i'm certainly deficient in o2 not only did it not change but actually went up a little bit um so that need to breathe is caused by an increase of co2 it's not caused by oxygen so anyone who says this is that i can't breathe i'm not getting enough oxygen i i guarantee well, i won't guarantee chances are very likely that that increase of co2 yeah. is is giving you that feeling yeah, that's what I think sometimes I get a little too geeky for my patients because I'll start talking to them because I'll ask them. We start working on nasal breathing and I'll say, how are you feeling? And they'll say exactly that. Well, I feel like I'm not getting enough oxygen in. And I'm like, well, actually, it's the exact opposite. What you're not used to is having those higher levels of CO2 in your body. And you need the CO2 because if you don't have the CO2, the oxygen will release from the hemoglobin. And they're looking at me like, okay, lady, yeah, no, that, <laughs> that's, that's breathe. That's when you lose them. <laughs> I mean, luckily in the age of COVID, it seems like a lot of people have one of these. They're yep. 20 bucks on Amazon yeah. or whatever. And to me, this is such a fascinating, especially a lot of people don't care about this stuff, but for a CrossFit person who's yeah. really like sort of geeky into that mm -hmm. stuff, mm -hmm. I would highly suggest working out as hard as you can, breathing through your nose yep. versus breathing through your mouth and looking at your blood sets. And I think you will be very surprised at what's happening. Yeah, no, that's a really, really good tip. Um, and then I found his other question. So we already did that one. He said, um, in exercise output, where's the threshold for training using nasal breathing? Only at, say, a lower threshold versus training with an open mouth, but performing at higher thresholds. I have a answer for that. It looked like you were a little disturbed by that question. But yeah, just... I, got, I think I have to read it again. <laughs> no, this is... These, these performance people, you know, they are hacking their body to be yeah. total badasses and all these little things absolutely matter. You know, a 1% difference one day to, to the competitor, mm -hmm. to somebody else, it makes a difference. So what I learned from Anders Olsen, from Patrick McEwen, from many other people who have studied this stuff with elite athletes, with Olympians, with rowers, with uh, ultimate fighters, I mean, on and on and on. They said, you do not work out harder than you can breathe correctly. So that moment when you're like, yeah. you need to slow down. Mm -hmm. And this is a hard thing for people because they're gonna say, I'm not getting my workout. You need to slow down and build your, build your aerobic base up. Yeah. Because how do you burn fat? You burn fat with oxygen. So if you're slipping into this anaerobic zone, you have more lactic acid, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it is not as efficient, especially for making yourself fitter. You can slip into that on occasion. I know these really elite athletes use the anaerobic zone and they try to maximize it. That's cool, but you really have to build an aerobic base. And that's what the nose is so good mm -hmm. at doing for you. 
So I think that, again, when you look at these elite athletes who have switched, the science is very clear, the, the benefits yeah. of it. So, so don't work out any harder than you can breathe correctly. We'll look at, um, what was it, Sonia Richards-Ross, right? Yeah. She trained using the Buteco method. Um, and you, like in the pictures, if you Googled her and you saw her running next to the other two competitors, their mouths are wide open. And here she is, like, doing her thing. <laughs> I mean, she was only the top sprinter in the world for 10 years. So don't, yeah. don't take her word for it. <laughs> no, but there's, there's so many others. I mean, yeah. not just, she's a great example because the photos, she just has this placid look, just yeah, destroying, like she did everyone, anything. <laughs> destroying everyone. And her recovery is so much more efficient. It's, it takes yeah. less time because her heart rate is lower working at this. Anyway, it's the way to go. It's difficult, but yeah. stick with it. Um, and then I want to end on this question that somebody asked, which I actually loved. Um, she wanted to know any challenges and pushback you received regarding your work um, and any encouragement you have for those of us fighting the fight daily in this field, trying to create, you know, a healthier world, healthier breathing habits, you know, for our children and our families and just everybody. Mm -hmm. I expected a lot more pushback, I'll, I'll be honest, mm -hmm. and was braced for it. And I have sort of this council of experts at some of the top institutions, Stanford, <laughs> Harvard, and U, UPenn, and who, who were ready to, to really dig into this. Yeah. And I'm surprised that for the most part, it has not happened. Mm -hmm. um, from most of what I've heard from Dennis is they're like, duh, this is what we've been saying for two yeah. decades. Mm -hmm. And even my friends who were really trying to, you know, they, they love to, to pick at me. He was <laughs> on a, he, he always goes cycling with this, with two dentists and who have these huge sweeping clinics, really successful guys. And he asked them, he's like, what do you think about this? He's both of them said, this is kind of the dirty little secret we've had, but the time has come. They're completely changing their practices. Mm -hmm. They said, okay, the cat's out of the bag now. Yeah. And it, and we know the importance of this. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, at the same time, there's still people who say breathing is nothing more than a placebo effect, uh, zero. Regardless of the fact that anyone can measure how breathing affects you right now, how it affects your blood pressure, how it, mm -hmm. so, you know, you're gonna hear that stuff and it's, what do you do? The, these are people who willingly do not want to look at the science. And, right. you know, I tried to prepare for this by, in the back of the book, if anyone wants to see the studies, if anyone wants to see where I got this stuff, who the people are who have been researching this, at what institutions, there's something like 400 scientific references. There's more on my website. There's x-rays, there's videos. Um, and people, they still, some, some people, it's been a small amount, I've been very grateful for that, but still say it's impossible for the body to, to heat up uh, by breathing, it's impossible to affect your posture, but go tell that to Herbert Benson at Harvard, who researched it 30, <laughs> go tell that to Wim Hof, who can sit in an ice bath and not have his core temperature go down over two hours and not have frostbite and not have hypothermia. So to me, it's, I, I would say expect this stuff because this is what has happened with science the whole way through. If you look at the history of science, it has really nothing to do with the accumulation of data, what's mm -hmm. gonna change people's minds. It has to do with political movements, has to do with emotional movements, it has to do with these revolutions. There's this whole book about this by Thomas Kuhn put out the structure of scientific revolutions. That he's like, the data has been there for a long time, but there has to be this moment where people are suddenly gonna say, aha, and as, awful as this COVID thing has been, I think it's really helped people reassess how they are looking at their bodies, how are they are looking at health, mm -hmm. how Western medicine is treating us in a lot of ways. And, you know, I'm doing a talk at Stanford Medical School next month. So, so it shows you that this stuff is, it's changing. And at my hunch is it's going to change very quickly. And be, because the science is there, these, yeah. these people would not be doing this and supporting this if the science wasn't there. And it's so clear to me. hundred yeah. percent. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I do think it's, this is going to be what 
is on, you know, everybody's radar, I think. And especially, like you said, it couldn't have been, I mean, not that obviously we wanted COVID to happen, but with COVID, you know, being so prominent and all of that and people just taking a more interest and realizing how much their breath matters, um, everything seems to like be falling into place for people to finally understand the importance of it all. So again, I'm so thankful for you for writing this book. And um, I am so thankful for you coming on and taking the time to talk with me today. Um, do you have anything you want to leave with the listeners before we wrap up? No, I just want to say I was not dropping the Stanford name in there for any other reason than <laughs> I feel like a complete jackass now for the reason that this stuff is now being studied and taken very seriously at one of the top research institutions mm -hmm. in the world. They published a book by Paul Ehrlich a couple of years ago that mm -hmm. talked about everything we're talking about right now, Stanford University Press. And so I mentioned them because they are able to really lead this stuff For into sure. academic circles and get people to think about it seriously. That's why I'm so thrilled. It's like, okay, there's some real change happening here. And the only thing I would say is, you know, people are gonna criticize whatever. And that usually has more to do with personal reasons than it has to do with science. So keep your head down, just focus on doing the good work. You know what works as, as clinicians, you absolutely know what works. You know what the science has been saying for decades. Mm -hmm. And you know, if everyone isn't on board yet, don't worry about that. Just keep doing your thing. and it will happen just like what happened with food, just like what, what happened with so many other things. Absolutely. Well, thank you again so much. This was great. Have a good rest of your day and we'll have to definitely keep in touch.